Someone help me. Someone please read this. My name is Aaron Mathewson from Chicago, Illinois. My parents and I were kidnapped October 7th, 2018. I don't even know if we've been reported missing or if anyone is looking for us. We were beaten, blindfolded, and brought here. I don't even know where here is. All I know is it took them around an hour to get here, and the whole time the people took turns beating us. After the first day, the man came down to where we were handcuffed and shot my dad. He didn't even say anything. He shot him five times in the stomach and let him bleed out while my mother and I tried to save him. The entire time, the man just laughed at us as we struggled and pleaded that they let us go. Later on that day, my mom met the same fate. She was taken away first, and I have no idea what those bastards did to her. They brought her back in and shot her in the head, leaving her body on the floor in front of me. Her eyes were empty, just staring at me. I was told this morning that they have something very special planned for me. I have no clue what this is, but I knew that I had to try and escape. It's pretty quiet here during the day, so I figured that they may not be here. Fortunately, they left a stray bobby pin in my mom's hair, so I used that to get out of these cuffs. The door for the basement was unlocked, so I figured I would be able to get out and call for help. All the doors here refuse to budge, so I can only assume they lock from outside. The windows are either really tinted or one way, so people won't be able to see me. I tried to throw a chair through the window, but it just bounced off. Didn't even make a crack. I desperately looked for a phone, but there are no landlines and I can't find our cell phones. The only thing I found was a computer open to this website. There's a lot of people on here, so I hope someone sees this. Oh, God, I hear a car in the driveway. They're back. Please, someone help me. I don't want to die here. I need to get back into my cuffs before they realize I've been out. Please, help. Don't say his name. If you have a mirror in your hallway inside your home, Please do not say Mr. Prowler five times. Whoever has been known to say it has met a gruesome end. Legend has it, in 1883, a wealthy Illinois businessman named Jonathan Patrick was bludgeoned to death in front of his wall-length hallway mirror one dark and stormy night. But there was more to Jonathan than just an ordinary banker. Some think he was responsible for a rash of gruesome murders, who the Chicago papers dubbed the Prowler, a killer of numerous women and young couples in love. No one knows who killed Jonathan that night. Some say it was one of his victim's loved ones seeking revenge, or his very own wife, after finding out who he really was, decided to kill him before he could do the same to her. Whatever the case, they say he vowed he would return as he uttered his final words. Whenever somebody called out the Prowler, he would be there to claim his next victim. There's been 20 known cases up to now, most notably the Sanderson family. On September 18, 1992, Mr. and Mrs. Sanderson, their daughter Ellie, and her best friend Elizabeth were inside the family home on that dark and stormy night. At some point, little Ellie, aged believed to be 16, asked her friend if she wanted to play a game. Her friend Elizabeth said yes, and Ellie walked her over to the mirror. Have you ever heard of the Prowler? She exclaimed. No, Elizabeth responded. So Ellie explained everything in detail. Elizabeth had a look of concern on her face, but still went ahead. Ellie began, Mr. Prowler, Mr. Prowler, Mr. Prowler, show yourself. 
I don't think we should do this, Elizabeth said nervously. I think you should stop. Stop being such a baby. Nothing's going to happen, Ellie replied. Mr. Prowler, we're waiting. No, Elizabeth screamed. Don't do it. She backed into the living room. I don't want to play this anymore, Ellie. Just stop. Just then, a door opened down the hall, and out walked Mr. and Mrs. Sanderson. What's all the screaming for, girls? Oh, nothing, Dad. Then Ellie turned around with a smile on her face and looked into the mirror. Mr. Prowler. Just then, an arm reached out of the mirror and slashed Ellie across the throat. She fell back into the living room, falling at Elizabeth's feet, gasping her last breath. Mr. and Mrs. Sanderson stood, stunned in the opening of the hallway, trembling in fear. Then the apparition of the prowler stepped out of the mirror and butchered the trembling parents. He then pointed at poor Elizabeth, who was covered in blood. Did you call the prowler, little girl? Elizabeth screamed, turned to the front door, flung it open, and ran into the night. No one believed her story, and she was charged with the deaths of the Sanderson family and locked away in an institution. But the people who were close to the situation know what really happened, and that poor Elizabeth could never carry out those gruesome deaths. Sadly, these strange murders are becoming more and more frequent now. So whatever you do, no matter what your friends might say, just please, please, don't say his name. During an early summer morning, me, my sister Sarah, and my friend Tommy are going to visit the cemetery called Bachelor's Grove. It is a very famous haunted cemetery in the Chicagoland area. It's located in the southwest suburb of Melothian, Illinois. We headed out in my car. It took about 35 minutes from the south side of Chicago to get there. We got there at 10 in the morning. I parked off the side of the road from the turnpike where I can hide the car in the trees of the Rubio Woods. This is a forest preserve area covering the cemetery and no road to drive up to it. At least I couldn't find one. We got out of the car and walked through the trees until we found the trail that led up to the cemetery. The trail was a dirt path and cluttered with dead leaves and fallen trees. It definitely wasn't open to the public as it's not used too often by the looks of it. It was a narrow path. As we were walking the dirt trail, I noticed a little breeze kicking up. I could hear the leaves rattling in the wind. It was a pleasant calming sound. Also, the birds were in song that early morning, singing and flapping their wings when they take off in flight. It was a calming experience, that's for sure. Peaceful. The morning sun was shining through the trees. I felt the heat of the sun rays on my arms. A perfect morning. As we began to walk our, to the cemetery, I started telling Sarah and Tommy about the cemetery and its lore. I mentioned the story of the Madonna and her carrying her baby, the story of the disappearing house, the phantom dog, the hook, the yellow man, and the story of the caretaker. I also told them of the story of the phantom vehicles with no drivers. I tried to scare them a little, and it's a good way to get them a little frightened before we get into the cemetery. As we walked, I saw a chain-link fence surrounding the cemetery. I noticed a broken entrance gate. It was wide open and holes in the fence of the gate. It gives it an eerie look to the cemetery, kind of weird-like. I also noticed how small the cemetery was. It wasn't that big. I was surprised. My sister Sarah entered first, and then Tommy, and then myself. As we walked, I noticed a lot of the broken and tipped-over headstones. They were scattered around the cemetery. I also noticed the uncared-for lawn. It wasn't really a lawn anymore. It was tall weeds and grasses, a lot of patchy dirt as well. A lot of dead fallen leaves blown up against the fence, and some lying on the ground throughout the cemetery. As I walked around, I was really looking into a lot of the details. I started noticing the sunken in graves. These graves were dug up. It's crazy to see that. The big patches of sunken dirt. It's sad as the headstones were tipped over and a lot of the names were worn off by weather and time. I walked up to one of the sunken in graves. I kneeled down and touched the dirt. I felt a weird vibration. It was something that went up my arm. Not sure if it was nerves or if it was real. I haven't felt anything like that before. I took it as nerves and my imagination. I stood up and stared deeply into the dirt. The sight of the grave got to me, thinking of someone digging it up. I was still staring at the dirt, and the dirt looked like it was actually moving. 
It looked like it was alive or something. You know, I got a dizzy feeling. I closed my eyes and looked again. The dirt wasn't moving anymore. Strange to feel this. I felt attached to the grave and felt it sad too. After I started to walk around more, I noticed that I couldn't hear the birds anymore. I mean, there was absolute silence. Strange. I didn't even hear the winds blowing through the trees either. I saw the leaves blowing in the breeze on the trees, but no sound. This is weird. I didn't even hear Sarah or Tommy talking. I felt like I was deaf. I couldn't only hear my heartbeat a little faster. I also started to notice the sky was gray. I mean, no sun whatsoever. The sun was shining just a few minutes ago when we entered the cemetery. Now it was gray and darker, cloudy, colder. Strange. Hey, where are Tommy and Sarah? I asked myself. Did they just leave me here alone? Are they playing a trick on me, a joke? I mean, this place isn't that big. I should be able to see them. Maybe they are getting together. Oh, well. I'll catch up with them. It's weird that they would just leave me. Maybe they didn't leave. Maybe they disappeared, taken. Wait a second. I'm starting to freak myself out. Let's not get crazy, I told myself. I walked around and looked at the fallen and broken headstones. I noticed single roses on the headstones on the fallen ones and the ones still standing. Someone was here. They weren't there a minute ago. How can those roses just show up? We didn't bring any. This is getting strange. I started to get a feeling of dread. I started to sweat, getting dizzy again. I even panicked a little. I wanted to get out of here. I started to go to the exit gate. It wasn't there. Just a fence. I walked along the fence so I could find the gate. I walked the whole cemetery. No gate! What the hell is this? I reached out and touched the fence and I wanted to get ready to climb it. Another shocking vibration. The fence is electrified? I asked myself. I can't get out. I'm trapped. I panicked and ran back to the middle of the cemetery, right where the sunken grave I became attached to. I started to breathe a little heavier, not sure where I can go and get out of here. I need to get out. I looked back and forth to find the gate. Nothing. I started to hear a soft voice calling my name. Bobby. 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 I thought maybe it was Sarah or Tommy, but I didn't see them. It sounded like it came from the graves. I felt a cold touch on my arm, like a frozen hand. I screamed, ah! Then the voice said, Bobby, you will be here with us forever. You will be one of us. You are now part of the cemetery. This is nuts, I said. I'm not hearing these voices. I'm just panicking. I started walking again, a little faster and faster, trying to calm myself down. Feeling this dread is not my usual way. I walked up to another grave as I was drawn to it by force. It was covered with toys and flowers. This is the infant daughter grave. This is the one that the Madonna is said to haunt and carry the baby. Now I hear a crying baby. And then the toys and the flowers started to float around the grave as something invisible was picking them up. What the hell's going on here? I turn and look and see something coming at me. I couldn't tell what it was. I started to run. But I didn't know where I can go. I'm trapped. I look back and I feel like I'm not even moving. Stuck in this mud. I then look back to my front and I tripped over a small headstone. I get up and I continue to run to nowhere. My God, there's the gate. I get to the gate and it's open. I exit the cemetery and stop to take a breath. I notice I can hear the birds chirping. Also, I can hear the leaves blowing in the wind. I then notice the sun on my skin too. What a great feeling. I started to calm myself down. My heart was racing as fast as any more. Sarah said, this was boring. All we did was enter, look around for five minutes, and now we're leaving. Tommy agreed, said it was nothing scary about this place. Nothing happened. I looked in amazement as they were exiting right after I left. I asked if they were there the whole time, and they said yes. We were only there for five minutes. I asked if they had any weird experiences, and they said no. We headed back to the car. I was silent. Let's just say I never went back to that cemetery again. The Cost of Modern Art The day had been long and tiresome, every second a beckoning siren until finally the man was allowed to rest. The apartment, while still bare, had finally achieved some semblance of being a lived-in space. A half-finished canvas, if you would so kindly like to imagine. His mind swirled like a deep and unforgiving fog, as the sound of the local news dampened like oxygen into a partially collapsed lung. Late last night, at around 2.34 a.m., local police and SWAT units were sent on a no-knock raid to the home of famed artist Arden Baptiste. This drastic action, taken after an unknown source, reported seeing Baptiste dragging a bloodied and unconscious woman into his home. 
The police quickly found rows upon rows of sculptures in the basement and no sign of Baptiste. Upon further examination of the walls, the police were able to find a hollowed out portion and recover the body of the woman encased inside. According to the police commissioner, the body had been severely brutalized and partially held together in an amber mold. Officers that had been on the scene described the body as glowing due to the presence of an industrial light aimed at where the wall had been. She was later identified through dental records to be a student named Christine Beckham, who had only began her junior year at the University of Chicago. Baptiste had become famous two years ago when he demonstrated an uncanny ability to capture human emotion in his sculptures. Experts around the world lauded him for it, and people from all over the world flocked to our humble city after he had announced his magnum opus was to be unveiled today. It goes without saying that his disappearance and the murder of Christine Beckham has brought not only confusion to many, but outright fear that he has seemingly hidden such a grisly act for days prior. More on this story as it develops. Baptiste smiled from the comfort of his dilapidated chair, mulling over the thought of the police pouring over his handiwork. He imagined every grisly detail unraveling before them like a VHS tape on rewind. He hoped they would deduce that he had forced that final smile upon her face with wire and resin. His warped smile turned into turgid laughter, just as he hung up on the 911 dispatcher to report his own whereabouts. He thought of himself as the next Michelangelo, embodied with greatness. Then he slit his own throat. Stop ignoring me. Why don't they listen to me? I'm their mother. Everyone knows that mother knows best. Instead, they just blandly ignore me. I tell them to do their homework, brush their teeth, make sure they have their house key. Instead, I met with blank stares and no reply. They just walk by me. Teenagers think they know everything. My husband hasn't talked to me in two weeks. I'm not exactly sure what I did wrong this time. We had a mild argument over our daughter's choice of clothing, but it was nothing major. I wonder if I said something wrong. This is the longest we have ever gone without talking. I've tried to communicate, but he's cold. No reply. He won't even look at me. I always felt so alone in my own house. In my husband's eyes, I never did enough. In my children's eyes, nothing I ever did was right. In my job, I was mediocre at best. I never lived up to the expectations that people had for me. I'm drowning in my own feelings, this overbearing sadness. It never goes away. My friends say it's normal to feel sadness sometimes, but this was every second of every day. It consumed me. It took over my mind and body like a dark cloud. It makes my chest heavy. It makes everything seem like I'm living in slow motion. When my husband got home from work, he turned on the news. I tried to kiss him, and he just walked past me. So I sat beside him on the couch and watched with him. Breaking news. Missing Chicago woman's body has been found deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. The woman on the screen was me. The dinner. Thanks for picking the place tonight. I sat across a handsome face at a new up-and-coming restaurant, or so I've been told. 
anxious and excited. This was the first date I've had in a long while after getting out of a rather toxic relationship with my fiancé of three years. So to finally get back in the dating pool and give things another try was a mix of emotions. Excitement, nervousness, fear. Yet it was all coated with a thin layer of giddiness. Not a problem. I heard a lot of good things about this place from a few friends, and my past experiences here have been great. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. My date Vincent smiled back at me, preening under my gratitude as he tapped his fingers along the dark wooden table as we sat. Yet despite this place being a new and popular restaurant, there was hardly anybody in here. I took it as a sign that it was a very underground restaurant, a rare find among the many in Chicago that you had to know where to look. We idled with conversation as I perused the menu. It struck me a little odd that there weren't any descriptions or pictures, just names and prices, which even still were a little difficult to decipher. Vincent leaned over the table and began to point to a few of the items on the back side of the menu, mentioning that they were great starters if you were new to the food and wanted something milder. I nodded slowly and settled on one of the items. The waiter, a small woman, came over and eventually took our orders and handed our drinks out. She seemed overly pleased at my dinner choice and shared a glance with Vincent. I noticed it immediately, and I suppose the look on my face cued him off. Oh, sorry, she's an old friend from high school, he explained. Eventually, the small waitress placed our food down, bowed her head slightly, and scurried away back around the corner. The food tasted off. I don't know why, it's something I couldn't quite place, whether it was the style of cooking, the seasoning, or what. I could feel myself growing sick. I excused myself, went to the bathroom, and as I headed back, that's when I saw it. Through the window of the kitchen door, I saw blood. Blood and a small chunk of arm being chopped up by the chef. I ran. Vincent noticed the panic and stood up, startled, asking me what happened. I started crying and pointing at the back, towards the doors, incomprehensible and sputtering. He followed to look at where I was pointing, and the worry from his face vanished, turning into a blank expression, maybe even a bit disappointed and annoyed. Oh, I thought something actually happened. Tonight was going so well, too. <sighs> he sighed before latching onto my arm and dragging me kicking and screaming into the kitchen. The Sleep Olympics When my parents separated 15 years ago, my little brother Daniel and I went to live with our father in his small Chicago apartment. Dad slept on the couch while me and Daniel shared the only bedroom. We were age six and eight and squabbled a lot, like most brothers do. My dad always seemed grouchy and he'd often burst into the bedroom yelling for us to quit jumping on our beds and get to sleep. But five minutes later, we'd be goofing around again. We knew our dad's bark was worse than his bite. But one night, he hit upon a new tactic. You kids ever heard of the Sleep Olympics? He said slyly. Lie real quiet and still and see who can fall asleep first. But you'd better be quick for the sleep referee will be watching. Of course, this shit really fired our young imaginations. Next morning, we had about a thousand questions about the sleep referee. But my dad just snapped back that we should get your silly asses to sleep. 
and you'll never have to see him. Now quit bugging me. So every night, we'd try our hardest to fall asleep as soon as possible, which ain't all that easy when you're scared. I usually won, though Daniel would often wake me up, sobbing in fear that the sleep referee might show up. I was wise enough to eventually suss that the whole thing was simply a ruse invented by my dad, but Daniel sure believed. Once or twice, he said he'd even heard the floorboards creak beside our beds while he lay suppressing his shivers, too terrified to open his eyes. Daniel begged me to let him fall asleep first, but his nerves were so shot that he'd inevitably be the last one awake. The whole thing died a death eventually. My dad got a raise, so we moved to the suburbs with our own bedrooms. Plus, you just gotta grow out of these things, right? I'd pretty much forgotten all about it until I visited Daniel today, and boy, those memories came flooding back. We were reminiscing about those dark few months in that small apartment. Daniel sure hadn't ever forgotten about the sleep referee. He'd never previously told me that late one night, right before we moved away to the sticks, he'd opened his eyes for a moment and had actually seen the ghoulish adjudicator stood watching us both. He described a gaunt figure with sunken black eyes wearing a long striped referee shirt. Little Daniel never got to visit Mom in her secure psychiatric ward, but I did, once, right before she died. I'll never forget how thin and pale she'd become, as if she was wasting away. She'd been refusing to eat, but it was okay, she calmly told me, sitting there in her long, striped, hospital-issue gown. All she ever needed was to see her boys. My eyes wandered to the little window in her room, surely too small for anyone to slip through. Chop Meat It was a cold Illinois night as I walked down a dim, unusually vacant street after a long day's work. The stillness of the darkness unsettled me as I ingested my now ill-fitting pants. The only thing distracting me from my inevitable frostbite was a rumble in my stomach and the rancid smell coming from my clothing. I stopped for a second and examined my blood-soaked apron and clamped my tired hands together, hoping to retain some warmth. I continued walking along the sidewalk until I noticed a brown paper bag perched up against a light post. The brown bag had a sticker holding it closed that read, Grade A Meat. The bag and label looked familiar, as it is the same type we sold at the shop. I scanned around my surroundings to see if the bag belonged to anyone. No one was to be found, so I took the meat home. When I arrived through the front door, I was greeted by my two young children, Teddy and Nanny. Their malnourished faces were masked by their big smiles. I smiled back and told them that we are going to eat good tonight. As I cleaned the dirt off Nanny's face, I decided to cook one of their favorite dishes, Sloppy Joe's. The children squealed with glee as they hadn't had a proper meal in ages. They go back to their play as I rummaged through our tiny house to the kitchen. I took the meat grinder out and gingerly started separating out all the meat. I was surprised by the quality of the cuts and wondered if it was veal as I continuously grounded up the meat. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I came across a finger, a human finger, feminine in quality. I glanced over at my gleeful children, happy in play, and tossed the finger in the garbage bin. I finished preparing the meal and sat my children down. 
They devoured their manwiches with vigor, and I could not help but smile because my children were finally going to sleep with a full belly. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel. Your generosity means the world to me. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness or Twitter at duchessofdark and two. I want to thank you all for your support, your kindness, and your encouragement. I appreciate it so very much. Until next time.